All right, hey everyone, so it's three o'clock, so I'll start now. Uh, this week is week six, so we're two-thirds of the way through the course. And this week, we'll be approaching the last of the four fields of competition math, combinatorics. And in past weeks, we did an algebra, a geo, and number theory. Combinatorics is basically the study of counting and probability. And as usual, the handout is posted on our website, and we'll follow the first half of the lecture, after which we'll transition to competition problems. So we'll get started with this week through an example question in order to demonstrate one of the fundamental aspects of combinatorics. So Adam is making a sandwich. He has to choose from three types of bread, two types of cheese, and four types of fillings. And we want to know how many different types of sandwiches are possible. So this question just takes a bit of reasoning. We can start by seeing how many ways are there to choose a bread, which is obviously just three. Then for each of those three ways to choose a bread, you have four ways to choose a filling, which creates 12 bread uh, filling combinations. And then for each of those 12 combinations, you can also choose two types of cheese, which creates a total of 12 times two equals 24 combinations. So in, this basically highlights the property called the multiplication principle, which means that the total number of ways to do two independent events is the product of the number of ways to do each of them individually. So we'll also, before moving on, we'll review another topic pretty briefly called factorials. Uh, factorial works in the sense that some number n factorial equals n times n minus one times n minus two and so on, all the way up to one. And this thing shows up pretty commonly in permutations, which we'll cover next. So uh, permutations are uh, one way of counting in combinatorics. So one example of a permutation would be, how many ways are there to order uh, the numbers one, two, three, four? And how many, uh, so first for our first problem, well, we can split it up into individual cases. So we'll look at the first term. So when we order it, the first number can be either one, two, three, or four, meaning we have four options to choose the first number. So it's four. Now, to choose the second number, obviously one of the numbers was used for the first number. So with the second number, we only have three more options left, which are the three numbers that weren't used for the first term. And so on, so for the third number, we have two options, and for the fourth, we have one option. So this is just four times three times two times one, which is 24. But as some of you guys may have noticed, this is also just four factorial. So this is an example of ordering or picking without replacement. So factorials generally come up with uh, orderings or uh, selections without replacement. So what if instead we wanna know how many four digit numbers have only ones, twos, threes, or fours? So in this case, it would be with replacements because we can have numbers like 1113, where the one occurs multiple times rather than just different ways to order the four numbers, one, two, three, four. So in this case, well, we can use a similar approach. The first number, there are four numbers that can be it, one, two, three, four. But since we're not restricted by, uh, it has to be including each of the numbers at least once, the second number can also be any of the four numbers and so on for a third and fourth. So, so what we get is that this is four times four times four times four, which is just four to the fourth power, which is 256. So one of the fundamental properties of permutations is that they're ordered. So when we were finding the number of ways to order one, two, three, and four, uh, well, we were finding each different ordering of the numbers was unique. So we counted one, two, three, four as a different thing than one, two, four, three. However, if they're not considered uh, individual, then we come up with our next topic, which is uh, combinations. So for combinations, unlike with permutations where order matters, the ordering of the terms doesn't matter. So the group of one, two, three, and two, three, one are the exact same thing because they have the exact same number of elements, or exact same element. So we'll demonstrate how to use combinations through an example question. How many ways are there to choose three kids from a class of five? So this is a combination question since it doesn't matter if we choose the kids in order one, two, three, or three, two, one, or two, three, one, or any other random permutation of them. But we can start by approaching this problem in the same way as we did with permutations. So for the three kids, for the first kid, we have five choices. Then there's four choices left for the second kid. 
and there's three choices left for the third kid, which would give 60. But now we have to account for the fact that we have duplicates. Each grouping of three is counted six times. Like for example, if we had chosen the first, second, and third kids, we'd have ended up counting them one, two, three, one, three, two, two, three, one, two, one, three, three, one, two, and two, one. Or in other words, there are three factorial duplicates for every term, which means that we have to divide our answer by three factorial in order to move all the duplicates. So our final answer would actually be five times four times three divided by six, three factorial equals 60 divided by six equals 10, as some of you have said in the chat. So we want to generalize this in for choosing any k objects from some group of n. And this is in fact called the choose function, which shows up very commonly in combinatorics. Uh, following the same pattern, if we want to choose n kids from a group of five, from a group of, sorry, k kids from a group of n, we would start in the same manner. So we get in the top, we'd have n times n minus one times n minus two, all the way up to n minus k plus one. And then we divide this by k factorial for the duplicates. However, this formula isn't particularly neat. So we might want to like try simplifying it a bit more. And we notice that the top is almost n factorial, just missing a couple of the terms at the end. So th to fix this, we can multiply the top and bottom by n minus k factorial. This basically makes the top go from n to n minus k plus one, and then from n minus k to one, which is equal to n factorial. And the bottom, it's k factorial times n minus k factorial. And this is the number of ways to choose k objects from a group of n. And this is also known as the choose uh, function. So the formula is basically n choose k, which we express in this format, is equal to n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. So we can also think of this as organizing n objects in some random order, and then picking the first k as your chosen object. There are n factorial ways to choose to order them, but then there are k factorial ways that the k objects can be rearranged, and n minus k factorial ways for the objects that you didn't choose to be rearranged. Which means that using the multiplication property, there are k factorial times n minus k factorial duplicates. So if we divide by n factorial by that, we get the total number of ways. Next, we'll move on to one of the most famous constructions in common torics called Pascal's triangle. All right, so Pascal's triangle is probably arguably the most famous thing in common torics. So uh, it's, it, it's basically a construction where you start out with uh, the zeroth row, which has a single one, and the first row has two ones below it. And for each subsequent row, you see that it's the sum of the two terms above it. So our second row is one, two, one. Since the only term above the one is one, the two terms above the two are one and one. And then the term above the last one is also one. So we get one, two, one, and then so on. So we get one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one, et cetera. So one special property about uh, the rows and the indexes is that uh, if you look at the kth element of the nth row, the, this is equal to n choose k, and this is always true. So the reason of this is because of one way to look at it is a combinatorical argument. In this case, it would be path counting, where we can think of the number in each square as a number of ways to reach the square by going only down and uh, downwards. So the number of ways to reach the two in the second row will when you start from the zeroth row is you can go down to the left then down to the right or down to the right then down to the left and it gives you two paths which is two and this just gives and it follows from this argument that uh it gives us the number of ways to do it because if we think about it in another way uh we have to go down n times to get an element in the nth row and we have to get to the kth element which makes k of those moves down to the right. So basically, out of the n moves that we are going downwards, we are choosing k of them to go to the right, while the remaining ones will be to the left. So this gives us n choose k. So this leads to the, funnel, uh, the fundamental identity, which you can see by explaining uh, by Pascal's triangle, which makes it very obvious. But 
if you have n choose r plus n choose r plus 1, this would equal n plus 1 choose r, which is just the result of the two terms above each term. So for example, the three in the third row, the two terms above it are one and two. One and two obviously sum to three, and this is always true. So uh, we can use something, uh, another property is that the rows of each column, or the rows of the Pascal's triangle, each sum to two to the n. So when you're on the nth row. So if you look at the zeroth row, you have one, which is obviously equal to two to the zero. If you have uh, the, sec the first row, you have one plus one, which is two to one. The second row is one plus two plus one, which is four, which is two squared, and so on. So we can use another combinatorial argument to explain this. So the sum of all the rows is basically the number of ways to form a subset of any size from n objects. So basically, from n objects, you have n choose zero plus n choose one dot 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 to n choose n and that will be one row. But that's also just the number of ways to pick any size subset from n elements. And another way to count this is that for each of the n elements, they can either be in, us, in the subset or outside of the subset. So they have two states. So for each element, they're either in or out. So there are two possible states. So since they're n elements, they're two to the n possible subsets. So this leads us to our identity that the sum of each row is just two to the n. So uh, the final, uh, I guess, uh, major identity for uh, Pascal's triangle is called, is colloquially called the hockey stick identity. So if we look at like a uh, so-called hockey stick pattern starting from any of uh, the ones along the edges, basically as if you go along a diagonal, right, and you take the sum of those, the sum will just be equal to if you move one down and to the opposite direction. So as you can see here, we have one, three, and six, that's our diagonal. The sum of them will just be the term to, to in the opposite direction still going down, which would be 10. In this case, it just so happens if you just continue along the diagonal, it'll be 10, but that doesn't always hold true. So as you can see, since you have this kind of hockey stick shape, that's why it's called the hockey stick theorem. It also just makes it a bit easier to remember. So uh, uh, in terms of like mathematical uh, lingo, uh, this can just be written as like n choose n plus n plus one choose n plus n plus two choose n dot dot dot, or sorry, k, k choose k, plus k plus one choose k plus k plus two choose k plus dot 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 all the way to n choose k and this would equal n plus one choose k plus one. So note while this looks like it only talks about one direction, uh, Pascal's triangle is actually symmetrical if you look at it. So n choose k is equal to n choose n minus k. So this applies for both directions. All right, so our final topic that we're going to talk about is called the principle of inclusion and exclusion. And it's a way to avoid overcounting cases in a problem. And once again, this is easiest to demonstrate through an example. So we want to find out how many positive numbers under 100 are not divisible by 7 or by 4. So one of the key strategies for the problem is that it's easier to consider the complement. How many are divisible by 7 or 4? And subtract them from the total numbers. This is called complementary counting. And it's a common technique when it's easier to count what's not true instead of what is true. So for seven specifically, there are 14 multiples of seven under 100. Like seven times 14 equals 98, which is less than 100. So there are 14 multiples of seven. And similarly for four, we have that four times 24 equals 96, which is less than 100. So this gives us that there, since there are 14 sevens and 24 fours, the total number should just be 38, right? Unfortunately, no, we overcounted. Specifically, the three multiples of 28 were counted in both seven and four. So we have to subtract them since we ended up counting them twice. That means that they're only 14 plus 24 minus three equals 35 multiple numbers that are divisible by seven or by four. So if we want the numbers that are not divisible by seven or four, we have to subtract from the total. 
and the number of positive numbers less than 100 is just 99. So our answer just turns out to be 99 minus 35 equals 64. So we can generalize this to any two sets. If we have two sets of objects, A and B, the number of elements in the union of A and B, which we express like this, is equal to the number of objects in A, plus the number of objects in B, minus the number of objects in their intersection, which we express like this. And this basically, like while it's fancy terminology, it's basically the same thing we just did in our earlier problem. We have to make sure that we don't count certain elements twice. There are also ways to do this with more than two groups, but a lot more careful thinking is needed. For example, if we had three groups, we could start out the same way. The number of elements in the intersection of A, B, and C would equal the number of elements A plus B plus C. And then we'd subtract the intersections. But then if we note this time, there's one more type of element that is uh, counted in a different manner, the elements that are in all three sets. We counted each of those elements three times in this portion, and then another three times in this portion, which means that we didn't actually count them at all since we subtracted thrice and added thrice. So in order to make sure that we actually counted every element, we'll have to add them once again at the end, which would be the intersection of A, B, and C. So this basically just shows that when, over count, when counting in different sets, we have to make sure not to overcount elements that are shared between both sets. So now we'll move on to some of, some of the competition problems. So we'll start with a relatively simple question. Amy was born on a Tuesday. What is the probability that exactly two of her three best friends were also born on a Tuesday? So the probability that someone is born on a Tuesday is obviously just one seventh, since they're equally likely to be born on any day of the week. And we want the probability that two of them are born on a Tuesday and one is not. The probability of that would be one seventh times one seventh. And the probability that there, someone is not born on Tuesday is one minus one seventh. So putting this together, this would be equal six over seven cubed equals six over 343. However, there's also three choose one ways to select the friend who was not born on Tuesday. Like the formula that we calculated just now only assumes that the third person is the person who was not born on Tuesday but it's equally likely that the first person was the one not born on Tuesday or the second person. So our answer is actually three choose one times six over 343 equals 18 over 343. So this problem basically just highlights the importance that when, when choosing three people, you have to account for the order. When the order doesn't matter, you have to account for that by make, multiplying the probability by the numbers of way and ordering can occur. All right, so our next question is a bit more complicated. A player has two different male roles, two different female roles, and two different roles that can be either gender. And if five men and six women addition, how many ways can the six roles be assigned? And at first, this problem may seem confusing due to the gender and neutral roles. However, we can avoid this. We always want to find the easiest way to count something, so here we first count the non-gender neutral roles. Since the roles are different, there are five times four ways to choose the men's role. And there are six times five ways to choose the female's roles. And now all that's left is the general gender neutral roles. This is basically just choosing two people from the remaining seven, for which basically results in seven uh, for distinct roles, which means that there's just seven times six ways to do this. So multiplying this all together gives us 25,200. And this problem basically highlights, as we said in the beginning, there are multiple ways to count it, but you should always do the easier roles first. And in this case, which were the general neutral roles, since it's hard, it would have been harder if we don't know how many males or females are left after the, gender, after the roles that could be either one. So we count the easier cases first, which are the male-only roles and the female-only roles, in order to make the overall calculation a lot easier. All right, so our third question. So uh, we have 15 distinct points that are on a triangle ABC. So uh, there are the three vertices, A, B, and C. Uh, three other points are on one side, A, B. Four of them are on B, C, and the other five are on side C, A. And ask us to find the number of triangles with positive area whose vertices are among these 15 points. 
So, uh, well, let's try to simplify this a bit. So what do we know about triangles? Well, obviously triangles are formed from any three points-ish, right? So this would be the same as saying from these 15 points, we want to choose three points. These three points would be the vertices of our new triangle. So this would be 15 choose three. However, uh, if you think about it, it specifies that triangles have to have positive areas, which means that we can't have uh, degenerate triangles, meaning that the three vertices cannot be on a line. They have to be uh, linearly independent. So the only way three points can lie on the same line is if they are on the same side. So if all three points are from side AB or BC or CA. So this means we have to, since we overcounted, we have to subtract these extra cases. So for the case where three points are chosen from side AB, well, AB has the two vertices A and B plus the three other points, that's so five points. So there are five choose three ways. Similarly, since there are four points, four other points on BC, it'd be six choose three, and for CA, it'd be seven choose three. So what this becomes is that uh, our answer is 15 choose three minus five choose three minus six choose three minus seven choose three. So 15 choose three would be 15 times 14 times 13 over six, which is 455. Uh, 5 choose 3 would just be 5 times 4 times 3 over 3 times 2 times 1, which would be 10. Then 6 choose 3 would be 6 times 5 times 4 over 6, which would just be 20. And then 7 choose 3 would be 7 times 6 times 5 over 6, which would just be 7 times 5, so 35. So this comes out to our answer of 390. So uh, this problem highlights one method of approaching is to count a very simple way. So we counted picking any three points from 15, and then from there subtracting uh, our overcounted cases. Whereas if we just to try to count the normal cases without overcounting, it would be much more difficult. Okay, so on to our next question. This question is asking us how many subsets of the numbers from two to nine contain at least one prime number. So one way to approach this is to do casework by finding all the number of sets with one prime, then two prime, then three, then all four. That's a bit troublesome. So if possible, we always want to avoid a lot of casework since it can lead to overcounting or just other silly calculation mistakes. So what we can do here instead is see that the number of sets with at least one prime is just the total number of subsets minus the number of subsets with no prime. So once again, this is called complementary counting. So the total number of subsets is each of these numbers are either in a subset or not in a subset. And as there are eight numbers, they're basically two to the eight equals 256 subset totals possible subsets. And we want to subtract out the numbers that have no primes. So the only values over here that aren't primes are four, six, eight, and nine. So using these four numbers, we can only create two to the four equals 16 subsets which means that the rest of those two, the 256 minus 16 subsets have at least one prime. So our answer is simply just 240 subsets have at least one prime. And once again, this highlights the usefulness of complementary counting, as we only have to do basically one calculation for this thing. Well, if we had instead done casework on one prime, two primes, three primes, and so on, we'd have had to do a lot more cases and a lot more work. So our next question, uh, we have 20 students participating in an after-school program, uh, which offers yoga, bridge, and painting. And each student must take at least one of the three classes, but may take two or all three. There are 10 students taking yoga, 13 in bridge, nine in painting, and there are nine students taking at least two classes. So it asks us how many students are taking all three classes. So this is a pretty generic uh, principle of inclusion-exclusion problem. So we know based on PIE that, well, let's say we drew a Venn diagram, right? We had uh, the three categories, yoga, bridge, painting. So we'll call one Y, one B, and one P. So we know that in the entire circle of Y, there are 10 students. Entire circle of B, there are 13. And entire circle of P, there are nine. And we know that since there are at least, there are nine students taking at least two classes, 
Well, that, that corresponds to a region which is uh, like the three-petaled flower. So we shaded that in. So based on principle of inclusion exclusion, we know that if we take the sum of uh, the size of all of the sets, so Y, B, and P, and then we subtract uh, the pairwise union, so the union of Y, B, B, P, and P, Y, then add the union of all three, this would equal the total number of students since we know that they're, all of them have to take at least one. So this would be equal to 20. So we already know that Y, B, and P are 10, 13, and nine respectively. Oop. So we can actually, since we know that there are nine students taking at least two classes and this corresponds to a certain region, this region is actually uh, the sum of all of uh, is the sum of the two uh, pairwise, the three pairwise unions minus two times the middle section. So what this expression becomes is that we get that 13 or uh, 10 plus 13 plus nine minus nine, then minus X one more time. Because the middle section would be equal to uh, the pairwise union, uh, the three pairwise unions minus two times the center. So we subtract that from original sum, it would be plus two. So we subtract the middle section, which is X, and we get this expression. So this just, be, this gives us uh, X is equal to three. So yeah, we get our answer, which is three. All right, so our next question is about license plates. So many states use a sequence of three letters followed by a sequence of three digits as their standard license plate pattern. And given that each three letter three digit arrangement is equally likely, the probability that such a license plate will contain at least one palindrome is M over M. And we wanna find what M plus M is. So we can break this up into two easier cases. First is that the letters form a palindrome and second is that the numbers form a palindrome. The overall thing can form a palindrome since the letters and numbers are obviously different. So we'll go in the first case that the letters form a palindrome. So the first two letters can be basically anything. Like whatever this first letter is, wh whatever the first two letters is doesn't affect each other, but the last letter has to be the same as the first letter. So these two letters have to be the same while the middle one can be nothing. So the probability of this occurring, the we don't care what the first letter is, we don't care what the second letter is, but the third letter has to be the same as the first one. So there's only a one out of 26 chance of that happening. And using a similar logic for numbers, we would get that the first number doesn't matter, the second number doesn't matter, but for the third digit to be the same as the first one, it would, there's a one tenth probability of that happening. So we could just add these up, but then again, we'd be overcounting because there are cases where both the numbers and the um, letters are, both the numbers and the letters form palindromes. So we have to use the principle of inclusion and exclusion to find the union. So probability of both of them happening would be one over 26 plus one over 10 minus the probability of both of them happening. As they're independent events, we can just multiply them together because one happening does not change the probability of the other one happening. So then if we expand this over a common denominator, we get that this just becomes one over 10 plus one over 26 minus one over 260 equals 35 over 260, which simplifies into seven over 52. And given that the problem is asking us for M plus N, our final answer would be 59 for this problem. Okay, moving on to the next problem. So this problem is, uh, has 40 slips being placed in the hat, each bearing a number one, two, three, four, up to 10 with each number entered four times. And we draw four slips from the hat at random without replacement. And we wanna find the probability that, if P is the probability that all four slips bear the same number, and Q is the probability that only two of, two of them bear one number and the other two bear a different number, what is the value of Q or P? All right, so for this problem, we can first find P and Q individually. P is definitely the easier case since the number of ways to pick four identical cards is just 10. Either we can have four ones, four twos, four threes, or so on up to four tens. 
So on the other hand, Q is a bit harder. So, so for P, there's 10 ways. But on the other hand, for Q, it's a bit harder since uh, we have to deal with two different numbers. So first, when we, we notice that when we select two different cards from two different numbers, this can happen for any pair of numbers. So there's 10 choose, ways to, 10 choose two ways to choose which two numbers we pick. And then now that we have a pair of numbers, let's say one and three, what is the number of ways that we exactly two of each are drawn? There's just four choose two ways to pick two cards from one group and four choose two from the other. So in fact, that turns out to four choose two times four choose two. So putting this all together, this gives us that uh, 10 choose two is 45, while four choose two is six, which means that there are 16, 20 ways to pick two cards from uh, two different uh, numbers. Now, since both P and Q share the same denominator, as the total number of ways to pick any four cards is 40 choose four, we don't actually have to calculate that. We just need to find P over Q, Q over P, which would be 16, 20 over 40 choose four, divided by 10 over 40 choose four. But the 44 choose four doesn't particularly matter, so just 16, 20 over 10, equals 162. So this problem mainly highlights one of the common themes in combinatorics, is that even when they're asking for probability, a common way to solve it is finding the number of ways something can happen and then dividing by the total. Because if every, every single state is equally likely, this is the exact same thing as finding the probability. All right, so our next problem we have that in a card game, Nora draws cards at random and without replacement. So we already know since it says without replacement, this is probably going to have to do with permutations. So from a deck of 21 cards, we have 20 cards numbered 1 through 20 and one card that's marked a joker. So Nora keeps all of her cards until she draws a joker, in which case she stops. And it asks us, what is the probability that of the cards Nora keeps, there are exactly four primes? And it asks us to express it in a common fraction. So, well, let's try to simplify this problem a bit because, you know, I guess, you know, when we stop at whenever we get the joker, it's pretty complicated. So why don't we just consider, like, let's say Nora draws all 21 cards. Well, this will obviously be a permutation of the 21 cards. They're 21 factorial permutations. But we can also see something special because, well, in each of those permutations corresponds to one possible outcome that Nora can get until she stops at a joker. So in each of those permutations, uh, Nora, I like, if you look at the relative placement of the joker, it course each permutation corresponds to a specific uh, ordering in which Nora draws some amount of cards and stops at a joker. So like, let's say for a smaller example, there are only four cards. The permutation one, two, one, three, joker, two, four would correspond to just Nora drawing the cards one and three and stopping at the joker. So we have already come up with another way to count this. Now let's try to do more because this isn't, really quite simple. We still have a lot to deal with. We have 20 cards, right? Well, since it's only asking us about the primes and the jokers, right? The positioning of the uh, composite numbers don't really matter. They don't really affect whether or not the, this specific permutation satisfies the condition. So in our previous example, we had one, three, joker, two, four. It has one prime before our joker. However, if we removed all the non-prime numbers, so one and four, we'd have three joker two, which gives us the same condition where we have one single prime number before the joker. And this is something that remains the same if we remove all the constants. So since we only want to find the permutations where there are four prime numbers before a joker, we can actually just ignore all the constants, or not the constants, all the composite numbers and one. So this just becomes the, well, from one through 21, where are the primes? There's two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, and 19. So we have eight primes plus the joker. So that would make nine cards in total. 
So if we just look at the permutations of these eight primes and the nine cards, we want to find the number of permutations of these nine cards where the joker comes at the fifth card, meaning four primes are before the joker, the rest are after the joker, and the joker is right in the middle, it is the fifth card. So well, if we fix the joker at the fifth card, of the remaining cards, well, in the first position, we can have eight cards, in the second position, we can have seven, dot, dot, dot. So this is another permutation, so the permutation of the eight remaining cards. So the number of ways to order the cards where the joker is the fifth card would just be eight factorial. And the number of ways to order nine cards we already know is just nine factorial. So this simplifies, well, we can cancel out all the eight factorial with the bottom. So this just becomes one over nine, which would be our final answer. All right, so our next question actually deals with uh, intersection of co uh, combinatorics and number theory. So we want to find out how many ordered quadruplets of positive integers, A, B, C, D, satisfy the condition that the product is 336. So here we have a much more algebraic condition than the previous question. So all we want is that this ordered, uh, that A times B times C times D equals 36. So a common way to start a problem like this is to find what the prime factorization of 336 is. Uh, we could, if, if you prime factorize it, you'd find that 336 equals 2 to the 4th times 3 times 7. But now we note that since it's an ordered quadruplet, we don't actually care that the numbers are, have to be distinct, and the order matters. So we can actually split this up into the positions of the 2s, the 3s, and the 7s in each of A, B, and C, and D. So if we know that all four of these divisors so all four must be divided into 36, and within the quadruplets, there is one multiple of three, one multiple of seven, and four factors of two. So how can we divide this up? Let's do three and seven first, since they're a lot easier. We can basically make any of A, B, and C, D contain the three. So there's four choose one ways to see how to assign the three to one of A, B, C, or D. And the same thing goes for seven. So there's four choose one times four choose one ways to assign the threes and the sevens to A, B, and C, and D. Now the number of ways to split the four twos among the quadruplets is a bit different. We basically have to place four objects into four cups. And we can use stars and bars to do this. So it's covered in more depth in the handout, but stars and bars basically say we consider the four twos and three bars to separate the objects. And we'll place the three bars somewhere randomly in between these twos. This, for example, this specific distribution would mean that A has one power of two, B has two powers of two, C has none, and D has two. And the way to calculate the number of arrangements of this is simply considering that we have seven objects and we want three of them to be uh, bars while four of them are twos. So this is basically the same thing as just seven choose three, which means that the number of, total number of ways to assign all the twos, four, threes, and sevens is four choose one times four choose one times seven choose three, Evaluating gives us that four, four choose one is obviously just four, since there's one way to choose from four objects. And seven choose three is seven times six times five times four, or seven times six times five, divided by six, which is equal to 35. So our final answer is just 16 times 35 equals 560. Uh, one additional important note in this is that stars and bars only works when, so in this case, uh, the objects with the twos it only works when the objects, for example, the twos are indistinguishable, so they're identical objects. So there's nothing different between the first two and the third two. But another condition is also that the groups you're dividing into are distinct. So in this case, we are distributing them into the four different groups, A, B, C, and D. So if the groups, if it were an, an unordered pair, uh, we would not be able to use stars and bars. Or if we were splitting up distinct objects, so let's say different colored pens among four people, uh, we would also not be able to use stars and bars. So moving on to our next question. All right, so Ed has five identical green marbles and he has a large supply of identical red marbles. So we say this is uh, infinite supply. So he arranges the green marbles and some of his red marbles in a row and finds that the number of marbles whose right hand neighbor is, that is the same color as itself 
uh, versus the number or is equal to the number of marbles whose right hand neighbor is different is are the same so an example of such an arrangement would be green green red 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 green green red green so we can see the two greens in the front, well, they add one pair to uh, where the adjacent one is identical. Then you have one where they change, then two more where they're identical, one where they're changed, one where they're identical, one when they change, and one where they change again. So on both sides, there is five each. Or sorry, four of each, my bad. Uh, let M be the maximum number of red marbles for which an arrangement is possible. So, and let n be the number of ways we can arrange n plus five marbles to satisfy the, requ the requirement. And ask us to find the remainder of what n is divided by a thousand. So, well, the first step would obviously be to find what m is. So, in order to, so we want to maximize the number of marbles there are in total. So, well, we know that, well, if you look at the gaps in between each marble, they can either be the two neighbors are identical or two neighbors are different. So if they're n marbles, they're n minus one gaps. So basically n minus one is two times the number of marbles where their neighbors are identical or two times the neighbors are not the same. So, well, obviously if you wanna maximize the total number of marbles, we wanna maximize uh, the number of neighbors where they're not the same. So since the limiting number of marbles is the five green marbles, well, of the five green marbles, each individual marble can contribute at most like two pairs of adjacent marbles, but their colors are different. So if you had the sequence red, green, red, you have one green marble, but it would offer two pairs, red, green, and then green, red, where the adjacent marbles are different colors. So since we only have five green marbles, that means we have at most uh, 10 uh, pairs of adjacent marbles that are different colors, which means that the total number of adjacent pairs would be 20. So that would mean 21 marbles. Alternatively, uh, yeah, so we have 21 marbles. So now let's see how these are arranged. So we know that uh, the green marbles have to be separated. So that means it has to be, let's say like red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. So five green, six reds. Well, it has to be, at, you, well, you have to have this in some sort of form because if you're missing a red in between one of the greens, we will no longer be able to have 21 marbles. So basically from this position, we're just adding reds into various positions. Well, at first maybe you could think, oh, you can add red in any of the gaps. So we can approach it like that. But remember that each of the red marbles are indistingu indistinguishable, right? So if you add one, let's say before the first red or, versus, or after the first red, the two spots, it would yield the same result because you have two reds then a green. But notice how, well, if you look at the green marbles, they kind of act like dividers. They divide it into uh, six different sections, right? If you add one to each section, it's different from if you add it to a different section. But if you add a red marble within the same section, it's the same thing. So this kind of leads us to the idea that, oh, this is stars and bars, because you kind of have these different like boxes you can place things into, and they're distinct, like we just pointed out. And we also pointed out that the marbles we're adding, the red marbles, are indistinguishable. So this is like a pretty generic application of stars and bars. So here we have six boxes. So we have five bars, which are the five green marbles. We have five bars. And then since we have, here, there are 11 marbles here. So we have to add 10 more marbles. So that means you have 10 quote unquote stars. So that means the total number of ways to arrange the remaining 10 red marbles into this arrangement would be 15 choose five. And 15 choose five is 3,003. So since this is the number of arrangements, this is big N, which means that the remainder when divided by 1,000 would just be three. And that would be our answer.
All right, so our next question we have, the figure below shows a ring made of six small sections, uh, which are which you have you, you can paint on. So you're painting these six sections of a wall. Uh, you have four different paint colors available and you will paint each of the six sections a solid color. So you can only paint it one color. And the number, and we want to find the number of ways where you can choose paint, you can choose to paint all of the sections such that no two adjacent sections are painted with the same color. All right, so let's start out by, you know, how we would normally count this. So let's say if you look at the top right uh, section here, we can paint that four possible colors, right? There's nothing restricting it. There are no adjacent color walls that are painted yet. So this one can be painted four different colors. Now, if we look at, if you move clockwise downwards, the next section, well, we obviously can't paint it the same color as the first section. So there are only three possible colors that we can color it. Now if we go on, if we continue onwards, we see the next section, well, it can be any color but the section before it. So it's also three. And we can continue all the way down. So all the rest of them are three, obviously, right? So this would give us, uh, since there are five threes and one four, it'd be four times three to the five. However, if you think about it a little bit harder, you realize that we actually come up with a little bit of a problem. Because when we put three in for the last section, we actually forgot that it also couldn't be the same color of the second wall. So obviously one way to approach this would just be to, let's say uh, the second last wall was the same color as the first wall, in which case there are three options for that. But if it was a different color, there are only two options for that. But that's really messy. That's a lot of case. So we don't really want to do that. So we can use another method, which would be overcounting. Since we've already overcounted here, we have four times three to fifth, right? What we need to do would be we would have to subtract the number of cases where the first and last wall are the same color. So if the first and last wall are the same colors, well, we actually it actually looks kind of interesting because if you merge the first and the last walls, since they're the same color, you can make them into one wall. So you would only have five sections left where all five sections of them are different colors from whatever is adjacent to it. So we see that this is just minus. So the number of ways to paint the sixth section is just four times three to five minus the number of ways to paint uh, a five sectioned wall where no two things are being, are adjacent. So, well, we, we well, this is improvement, right? We have less wall section. So if we would continue this, we can express a five section wall in terms of a four section wall and then so on and so on. So, well, why don't we uh, formalize this a bit? We've made this interesting discovery. So let's make it easier to write out. So let's say uh, the number of ways to paint a six section wall such that no two adjacent things along the ring are the same color. We'll call this F of six since it's six sections. So we establish that F of six is four times three to the fifth, like we got earlier, minus, well, the number of ways to paint a five section cyclic wall, which is that no two adjacent colors are the same. So that would just be F of five. So this expression up here is equal to F of six. So if we continue this, we actually got a bunch of expressions. So the next one would be f of five. f of five would be, well, the first wall in f of five would be four. You have four possibilities. The next wall, three, 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 three. But then we overcount it again because the first and last wall can't be the same. So we subtract f of four again. And we see this pattern. It's like four times three to the n minus one minus f of n minus one. So f of four would be four times three to the third minus f of three. Then f of three is four times three to the squared minus f of two. f of two would be four times three minus f of one. Oh, wait. Be careful here, because if you actually look at f of two, if we drew the diagram for f of two, we have this ring, and then we split it into two halves, right? Well, the first section can obviously have four things, right? Four possibilities, the first section. And then, the and then the next section can have three. And we subtracted f of one because we overcount. But actually, we don't overcount here because 
the second wall is also the last wall. So it can't possibly, there's no possible case where the last wall is the same as the first wall. So actually f of two is just four times three, not four times three minus f of one. And f of one obviously is just four since you can just paint one solid wall, any of the four colors. So from here we get, well, f of two is four times three, which is 12. So that means f of three would be four times three squared, which is 36 minus 12, which is 24. Then f of four is four times three squared, which is 108 minus 24, which is 84. And then four times three to the fourth would be four times 81, which is 324 minus 84, so that's 240. And then finally, you have f of six is four times three to the fifth, which is four times 243, which is 900. Uh, it would be uh, 972. So minus 240, that would be 732, which would be our final answer. So this problem kind of highlights like, well, one, overcounting can be very useful. And also, you can actually like come up with like smaller cases and then like building off of them or like from big cases make them smaller and smaller until you get to a very easy case. And this is kind of leading into one of our future topics, which would be recursion. Uh, we'll get into that in a later lecture, obviously. But this is just a nice method to approach problems where you basically just make a hard problem and simplify it into a very easy problem, like painting one solid wall, one of four colors, that's obviously four, that's really easy. And from there, we solve this really difficult problem. So moving on, we have the figure below, or we don't really have a figure, but uh, this is not the right problem. Uh, sorry, one sec. Uh, so this is the problem, there we go. So we are on an eight by eight checkerboard. Alice is playing checkers on white squares. And asks us to find the number of ways Alice can place 16 checkers down so that no two checkers are diagonally adjacent. So we know that they're on only the white squares. So we also don't want it to be diagonally adjacent to any of the squares. So uh, if we were to draw, let's say an eight by eight checkerboard real quick. So uh, if we drew it like so, Uh, and you made it into a checkerboard where we have uh, alternating colors would be uh, black and white. Uh, one sec, uh, let us finish drawing this. All right, so this is an eight by eight checkerboard. And so uh, we'll not, we're not gonna color in, but let's say uh, the top left corner is white. So that would mean the bottom right corner, bottom right corner is also white and like alternating squares are white. So we, well, let's start out by drawing a few examples. So let's say we filled in the top right corner with a checker. Let's say that's a white square. We have a checker in this square, the top, uh, sorry, the top left, not the top right. Uh, this is a white square, right? Well, it obviously can't be in the square diagonally to the left of, or diagonally below it. So let's put it in the one like to the right of it. We can place one here, right? And we can place, actually in all the white squares in the top, we can play, place checkers there, right? So we can place one there, one there. And then we can actually just do the same thing in alternating rows and we get one possible case, right? So we have one here, 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 here. here there and there. So obviously this is one possible arrangement, right? This is a really nice looking arrangement. So uh, how can you move this around? So, well, we can't really move the top one. We, the only one we can really move, if we look at it, is the bottom right one. We can move it down one. We can move it diagonally uh, below it. So if we erase that and we moved it there. This will give us a new arrangement. So now, which ones can we move over? We can move over 
the one above the bottom right one right here, we can move that diagonally below it. Or the one to the left of the very bottom right checker, we can move this one. All right, so we can kind of see a pattern here, right? Well, actually, if you actually look closely, one special observation we can make that is very key to this problem is that, well, if you divide this eight by eight checkerboard into a 16 by 16, where each group is like a two by two square. So let's say we bolded the top right square or the top left square, bolded each of these two by twos. So we have these two by two units, like so. And then we can just, if we split it up into a bunch of these units, right? Well, we can see that like each of these units in both of our arrangements actually had always contained at, or actually not even at least, it always contained exactly one checker. So maybe this is really useful to us. So why don't we try to prove this? So one thing we noticed, if we drew a two by two on its own over here, so we have a two by two here, right? And let's say we have two black squares on the top right and bottom left. So we'll color this in since there are only two squares, right? Well, if we have a checker in the top left, we obviously can't have a checker in the bottom right. And the same goes if we have a checker in the bottom right, we can't have one in the top left, right? So each, each two by two can have at most one checker. Well, this comes in very handy because, well, we know that it can have at most one, but in our case, each of them has exactly one. And that's because, well, there's 16 of these two by twos in the whole thing, and there's 16 checkers. So that means since none of them can have more than one, each of them has to have exactly one because Let's say if we took a checker out of one of these, well, we can't put it anyway, anywhere else because each of the two by twos are filled. So it has to go into the last two by two. That means each two by two has to have exactly one checker. And something, um, we also noticed that each of the two by twos has two states. Either the checker is in the top left, in which we'll call this a one. So if, so if we, so if the checker is here, we call this a one, quote unquote. And if we had, if we drew another two by two and we had the checker in the bottom right, this would be called a zero, let's say. We'll just label these, right? So if we drew a four by four again, right? We just drew a four by four where each of these squares corresponds to a two by two on the eight by eight, right? Well, we can see that in our original, in our original example, all of these would just be ones because originally all of them would be in the top left. And then the one we currently have drawn here, it'd be all ones except for the very bottom right corner, which would be a zero. So you'd have a zero right there and then ones everywhere else. So, well, this kind of leads to another property that we see is that the zeros can only form, it seems, on the bottom right. So how do we prove this? So we notice that if, uh, if a 2 by 2 is in the state of a zero, well, then if we do another 2 by 2 next to it in our model above here, So, yeah, so there. Uh, if, if our original two by two was zero, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, there you go. If the original model two by two was in a zero state, which means the checker is in the bottom left, well then the two by two to the right of it cannot be in a state of a one because if it was in a state of one, you'd have a checker in the top left, which would be diagonally adjacent to the previous two by two. So that's a contradiction to our rule. And the same goes to if we put one in the uh, below a, a zero, if we drew another two by two below it, the only possible place we can put a, z a checker now is the bottom right. So we show that if there's a zero, 
That means everything below the zero and everything to the right of the zero can be a zero and it has to be a zero. So what this becomes is like, we kind of split our, let's say our example, this uh, four by four, we kind of split it into two pieces, right? Either everything, or you split into a top right or top left piece and a bottom right piece where all the things in this piece on the bottom right are zeros. Everything in the top left is ones. And this actually comes out with a pretty interesting property because if you look at a bunch of examples, like let's say the one we already had drawn up here, right? If you drew a line from the bottom left and then you draw it along the border of the ones and the zeros, it's actually just like a pathway from the bottom left to the top right. So if we were to draw any 4 by 4 and draw any arbitrary path along it, along the edges of the squares, so everything below the path would just correspond to a zero hypothetically. So let's say we draw one here and we have like this arbitrary path, right? If everything below and to the right of it was a zero and everything above and to the right of it was a one, well, this would satisfy one of our conditions. This would satisfy our condition of everything below and to the right of any zeros is a zero and everything above to right is a one, right? So, well, this just becomes counting the number of ways we can divide this four by four into two pieces, which is the same as just the number of paths from the bottom left to the top right. And this becomes a very famous problem in combinatorics, which falls under the category of path walking, in which you want to find, let's say, the number of paths from the bottom right to the top left. And what we can do is like, we can start out at the bottom left. How many ways are there to get from the first point to the first point? Well, obviously you just stay there. There's only one way. Assuming you can only go up and to the left, right? So how many, so then from here you can go up or to the left and there are only one possibility for each. So each of these are ones. Again, you can go up again from the first one or from the very top one, that's a one. But if you go diagonally downwards, you can see that this square, you actually have two possible paths. You can go up from the first, uh, up from the bottom one or right from the top one. So there are two possible ways and then one for the last one. You can just move directly from the one again to the one. So we can see this actually looks a lot like Pascal's triangle and it's actually by definition what Pascal's triangle is. You remember earlier we used our definition to prove that the numbers in Pascal's triangles are combinations is just the number of paths. So we can actually fill this out using Pascal's triangle. And we get all of these numbers. And we get that our final number is, well, on Pascal's triangle, it'd be H is four. And in this case, we get that by filling this out, it's actually seven, which is H is four. So that gives us our final answer in this case, which would be H is four, which is 70. And that's our final answer. So this is a very difficult combinatorial problem, mostly because what it involves is a lot of like difficult observations to like simplify the problem. Because obviously in the end where we are finding the number of paths from the bottom left to the top right, that was not too hard in terms of doing math and knowing like knowledge, right? Uh, we just need to know how to count the number of paths. However, when we looked at the initial problem where we have this really weird, obscure game where Alice is placing checkers on only white squares and they can't be diagonally adjacent, like these requirements are a bit, well, weird. You know, we don't really know how to count this because like there's a lot going on. And what we did was we just made a bunch of observations and patterns, right? And based on the observations, we simplified it once into instead of an eight by eight with checkers, we simplified into a four by four with ones and zeros. And from there, it was still a bit hard to count. I mean, you could count this without the path walking using a hockey stick in some way or form. However, uh, through another observation, we found that this is just dividing it and splitting it into two pieces. And then 
what we get is a much easier way to count. And th I guess this is really the essence of Comet Forex, which is not something you'll definitely get like early on. It's a m sort of sense as you develop as you progress to math, where you just find ways that are easier to count and easier to do the math. Because it's not always about like knowing fancy formulas. It's more of just making the problem as easy to do as you can.